also add the home mortgage interest, the thing that usually kicks us over. So I'm gonna say deductions, and let's go to, to the itemized deductions, interest, and let's say the interest was at like uh, 15,000. So now schedule A is populated, and now I can say, okay, we, we're over the threshold of the 15,000, and then it's pulling in that 2,900. So the 2,900 is basically taking the 4684, four, and we were at the 7,000, the 7,009 minus the 10% of the AGI, which is 50,000 times 10%, 5,000, gets us to the 2,900, which is pulling over to the Schedule A, and it's pulling it into the category of the casualty and theft losses. So now let's imagine that it was a qualified disaster situation. And again, I'm just giving like a general idea of how these are, are populated. And you want to look up the actual issue that's in your particular location. But let's go back on over and say that we have a qualified. We would need the, the address of the of the of the place that it took place in in order to populate it as well. But let's pick now. Let's say it was a qualif It was a California wildfire disaster now let's say it's a federally declared qualified disaster so a generic federally declared qualified i'm going to say california let's just pick a california code i'm just picking one here and let's say i'll pick i'm not sure the code matches but i'll pick one there and then everything else will remain the same so now it's qualified is what i'm trying to point out as being the difference so now it's pulling in here. It went from a casualty and theft loss to other itemized deductions. And now it says net qualified disaster loss. It's calculated a little bit differently over here on the form 4684, where it had the $500 deduction and you don't have that same, you know, 10% thing that's happened at the bottom of AGI, which was a big issue. In other words, if I, if I go back on over and say, there's the the 7500 if my bring my net income back up to a, to a, to 100,000 i go to my wages my net income is at 100,000 again then it's still at the 7500 i don't have that agi kind of thing and also now what if i wasn't itemizing what if i didn't own my home and i wasn't paying this 15,000 of interest i don't get that deduction so i can go then Let's bring that back off the table. And then I'm going to go back on over. And so now on the schedule, I still have a schedule A, you can see, but now it's a schedule A with the standard deduction kind of thing embedded in it. So now once again, it's not on the casualty side, it's in the other itemized deductions. So these things are kind of linked together now because this is one of the big ones that would be in either of these categories, depending on the situation. But now it's a net qualified disaster and you can see it pulled in the 7,500 from the 4684 just like before, but we wouldn't have got a benefit from it because we weren't itemizing and that's not going to kick us over the threshold in and of itself of the 12,950 to, to itemize. So it gives us the 12,950. So now notice what it's doing. There's the itemize or the standard deduction plus the 7,500. Let's just see, right, we're taking the 12,950 plus the 7,500, forcing us to basically get a benefit from this at the 20,450, and that's what's pulling over to the Schedule A. So you got, so it's a little bit tricky how they kind of work that Schedule A in these disasters. So is, is it, it's got to be a federally declared disaster. Is it a qualified disaster that could impact where it goes on the Schedule A? And then you may not have the same kind of threshold requirements if it's a qualified uh, type of disaster. So you want to kind of dive into those uh, qualified or those uh, federally declared disaster areas and do more research on them to make sure you're you're uh, up to date on, on the rules related to them. This is just a general conceptual overview of what might happen on the tax software side.